you might not know what you're looking at. The giant in front of you is known as Aldebron, with a diameter 44 times our own sun. This behemoth that burns brighter than 450 suns sits amid the Taurus constellation being dubbed the Follower. That is because it seemingly tails the Pleiades star cluster throughout the heavens. It is often depicted as the burning eye of Taurus the Bull, and ancient Persians would honor the star as one of the four royal stars, among Antares, Fomahalt, and Regulus. Many readings have been given to Aldebron, that it is a hunter chasing the Pleiades, that Aldebron was once its own star cluster, or that it had fallen to Earth and created the Mississippi River. While Aldebron is bigger and brighter than our own sun, of course, there is one that's just a bit brighter to us on our own surface. Something that outshines even Aldebron's divine radiance. Something a young boy would see when he wakes up. Schult, one of Priscilla's servants, is only 10 years of age. He maligns himself due to his own weak stature, hoping that soon his body would develop, and attacks himself for not looking manly enough. It's a theme that Tape seems to regularly touch on, the idea that the person in the mirror and the person you aspire to be are separate entities, the concept of one's own body image or self-perceived gender identity. He ponders why he's making no progress, thinking back to how Al had told Schultz that a good training regiment was one day of sword training and five days of rest, some intentional misinfo from Al, which at first is played for laughs but slowly recontextualizes itself as Al being the only person who treats him like a kid. As he examines his body, he suddenly feels something equivalent to the scorch of the sun, a presence that shines ever so brightly, as he turns to face Priscilla. She compliments him on his role as a bedwarmer, but Schultz still can't get his inferiority out of his mind. He apologizes for not being of any use to her like Al or the Redmongers, referring to her private army, and yet another reference to the color red. This is sort of abrasive, isn't it? Perhaps this onslaught of red feels overwhelming even. Red is quite the obvious color scheme for not just Valachia, but also for Priscilla head to toe. Whether it be her crimson red dress, her fiery eyes, or her orange hair, the red design is certainly doubled down on with the Redmongers. Red is oftentimes a very dramatic color. It's something that launched out at you, and a color that demands attention like no other on the spectrum. Carried with it are feelings of anger, dominance, or even dread. And due to it being such an intense hue, an overuse of red can be found overwhelming. Red in Japan specifically is also the color used of Shinto shrine gates, often symbolically representing the transition from the mundane to the sacred. The deep red is used to scare away evil spirits and represent protection, strength, and power, something very fitting for the Valakian theme of fate. She gets up and reprimands Schultz's desires, stating that she and she alone will decide how her possessions are used. She tells him to read a book instead, showing off her massive book collection in the mansion thanks to her husband, Lip Beriel. She refers to knowledge as the omnipotent staff. What use is a sword or shield in farming or healing? Knowledge alone is a staff that you can lean on in every circumstance. He eyeballs a red book with yellow markings that Priscilla is always reading, but she kills that hope before it even starts. It's her favorite, but it is not for reading. She says it is full of reminders. He would find nothing of interest in it, as what a reader seeks from a book varies from person to person. Even she does not read only to learn. But to feel the heart leap at a dramatic story is one of the pleasures of reading. In just a few pages, so much has been added to Priscilla's character. It's easy to view her as one-dimensionally mean and egotistical, and at times she certainly is those things, but the beginning of EX5 grounds her in a way. Giving her an interest in literature and guiding Schult towards bettering himself in her own way adds a lot of depth to her. She enjoys the experience of finding meaning in different books, and reading to experience art. Such a fundamental human experience from someone people might consider lacking humanity, as she opts to read Schult a story, the story of a sweet, beautiful young woman. The young girl who is dressed in red, being attended by six servants, sits for dinner, asking what the plan for the day is, as they begin to offer her some soup. However, she has one of the servants taste the soup before her to check for poison, something any noble of significance would have someone on hand to do. She begins to eat her meal, until blood pours out of her eyes and nose. The food taster stumbles, saying she did it, as blood spills out of her face, collapsing to her death. The young woman mentioned prior meets her end, or so we thought, as the real Prissa Benedict enters the scene, surviving the amateur assassination attempt. The rest of the servants mobilize to finish the job, but it's hopeless for them, as she gouges out their eyes and slashes their throats, before another person incinerates them in green flames. We're introduced to Arakia, whose design is fucking terrible. Arakia is Prissa's right-hand woman, not necessarily a spirit user, but instead a spirit eater. Despite all of her cruelty, Prissa still attends her body double side after death. 
stating she does not deserve to be seen like this. This is what establishes a super interesting trend for Priscilla, where she juxtaposes her harsh cruelty with her down-to-earth human empathy. We will come to see that she can be mean to people, she can be extraordinarily arrogant, but at the same time, she can connect to how other people feel. She can relate to ordinary struggles, even if she does so extremely coldly. We then get to see her unique expression of affection with Vincent, her brother, who we see in the previous book EX4. We don't know a whole lot about him besides the fact that he is extremely cunning and holds some sort of connection with Priscilla. And as EX4 takes place, closer to current ReZero, something happens during the Valakian Rite of Selection that somehow let two siblings survive. Vincent expresses shock that all of Pris's servants had been killed, and tells her to let him take care of things, saying it would be a lonely thing to lose a little sister for some asinine reason. They banter quite a bit in this conversation, but despite what on the surface seems like a prickly convo, it's also very clear that they are fond of each other. Something evidenced by Vincent drinking Pris's tea with no hesitation or a taster. Their sibling bond is broken by the entrance of Cecilis another character we get to know a little bit about in EX4. He, like Priscilla, believes himself to be the center of the world, believing he is the main character of a stage play. He served as a foil for both Reinhardt and Julius in EX4, being someone who acquired insane power despite displaying none of the tact of a knight, and someone who had no dignity and none of the humility befitting the title of number one of Valachia. He wants everyone to know he is number one as well, dressing in a way that makes him stand out, with his blue hair and robe, with blue often being used to symbolize relaxation or communicating an authoritative yet calm and confident presence, something that stands in sheer contrast with his own ego. In this very room many years in the past, that clashes with Prissa. An interesting thing to note is that Cecilos also wears a pink kimono, something that in Japan is worn to symbolize femininity and elegance. This design conflict between Prissa and Cecilos also boils over to their perception of each other, as she is not very fond of him and his self-absorbed attitude, and neither is her attendant Arakia. Vincent came to Prissa with one statement, to head to the capital city as their father, the emperor, will soon meet his end. Half-brothers and half-sisters sit side by side, gathered for this day. The emperor, Drazen Valachia, had had 66 total children, with only 31 living for this moment. Funnily enough, 66 is considered a low number of children, something that hung over his reign as emperor. Lamia, Prissa's half-sister, whose name in Arabic refers to shining or radiance, attempts to greet Prissa before being brushed off by her, being told her voice is more dangerous than a poisoned dagger. This convo stands in stark contrast to her convo with Vincent, as Lamia tells Prissa she loves the face she is making, the face of a child who knows nothing in this world, a little girl with no knowledge. Their vocal jabs at each other come to a swift end as Dryzen, the frail old man, stumbles into the hall. He says he notices a few have chosen not to kneel to him, as ten of his children stand tall. Prissa is called insolent by one of her brothers for standing, and she says that if they are true members of the royal family of Valachia, it should be self-evident which of them is correct. Dryzen asks why she does not kneel, and she replies that it is the apogee of the empire who taught its subjects to be strong, yet the emperor looks old and weak. There is nothing to kneel to. Tension fills the room until Dryzen celebrates her answer. That is what makes them his children, before he turns to the son who reprimanded Prissa, and asks if he would like to try himself summoning the Yang sword in front of him. The man reaches out, grabbing the hilt of the sword, only for his hand and by extension the rest of his body to burst into flame. The Yang sword is something that only continues to build onto the sheer intrigue that is Valaki as a nation. Observers, stargazers, and now this. How does it determine a worthy ruler? Does an observer dictate Valaki's empire? How was the Yang sword even made? And even more curiously, after his death, 31 Yang swords appear in front of the children for them all to try themselves. And now, a sword appears above Dryzen, informing his children their destiny stands before them, in the form of a sword. As he grabs the sword above him, self-immolating and ending his own reign. Vincent looks over to Priscilla, who mutters to herself how the world bends itself to her benefit, as she grabs the sword in front of her. Eleven people survived the drawing of the Yang sword, as the rite of imperial selection had begun. Lamia attempts to form an alliance with Prissa, then both knowing that Lamia was the one who attempted to assassinate her, as she backs Prissa into a corner where she cannot act. As with her private army known as the Pruning Force, she had nothing to gain from Prissa besides making her bend the knee. Valachia is an example of might makes right ideology, a memorable expression on the origin of morality. It asserts that a society's view of right and wrong is determined by those in power. While people may have their own ideas of good, only those strong enough to overcome obstacles and enemies can put their ideas into effect. A professor in philosophy in the early 1900s coined the term kritocracy as a government based on coercive power by those strong enough to seize control through violence. I've seen criticisms of Valachia society being able to stand for as long as it has, but this idea is one that can be traced back to teachers in ancient Greece. An ancient historian stated that, Right as the world goes is only in question between equals and power. 
while the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Valachia's empire is the express denunciation of objective morality, not necessarily asserting that the person in power is right, but more so they have the power to claim they are. Also, Valachia could be seen as stable, sure, but considering events like EX4, maybe it's not the best. Alongside Kratocracy, Valachia is also a mix of meritocracy, a political system in which economic goods and political power are vested in individual people based on their talent, effort, and achievement. This is a political concept that had existed for quite some time but was only coined by Alan Fox in 1956, before being popularized by Michael Dunlop Young in his book The Rise of the Meritocracy, a book that depicts a dystopian society. In the Meritocratic Education and Social Worthlessness book, Ken Lampert argues that educational meritocracy is nothing but a postmodern version of social Darwinism itself justifying social inequality as meritocratic. Philosophers often impugned meritocratic societies, referring to them as tyrannical, as the concept of meritocracy leads to ongoing stalled social mobility and increasing inequality that lays bare the crass delusion of the American dream. An example of this belief in this very book is Bartroy Fitz, a 27-year-old middle child of the emperor. He thought as times change, so too does the perspective of the people of Valachia. Bartroy is not part of the rite of selection, having dropped out of the contest. Meeting with Lamia, he aims to be an exception to Valachia's norms, and Lamia tells him that, should she win the seat, all ten of the children who opted to not participate will be under her protection. Lamia had helped spark this changed perspective for Bartroy, as when they were little, she would inquire if there was a way to end this bloodshed without harm. He joins her in her quest to overcome Vincent. They get to talking about Prissa, and how, if the rite had begun five years later, she would have been a prime contender for the throne. She tells him that she's aware the dropouts aren't fighters, but she needs their fury to help her win the election. As Bartroy chokes on the drink he had been given, collapsing to the ground and dying. Bartroy, unfortunately, was never long for this world as a person who challenged the status quo. That was the key to Valachia's stability. Oh, citizens of the Empire, be strong. The pruning has been completed. A massive force combined of six units of the selection candidates had joined forces in the field outside of Vincent's castle. He was the frontrunner for the throne, so taking him out quickly would be the most beneficial. They had amassed an army five times the size of Vincent's. The pruning force launches its attack on Vincent's castle, and in an instant, they feel a breeze go past. They put their hands on their heads, trying to hold them in place, as the necks that should have bone had been sliced through. Cecilus, wearing his pink kimono, goes on an absolute rampage. Prissa prepares to move onto the force, but a disconnected voice beams to her head from someone named Paladio. He tells her to stay back, but she says she has no intention of dancing to that vixen's tune, and she will also take his head. Trisha guides Vincent, someone who in EX4 served him quite closely, and his design is quite a bit different in terms of color here. Suddenly, however, Priscilla appears before them with Archaea. Vincent and Prissa both grab the Yang Sword and begin a dance of heavenly steel. The heat from two intersecting Yang Swords wards off any of the other fighters, as Arakia and Chisha begin to trade blows. She consumes a blue spirit and ignites the army around her, as Chisha equates both her and Cecilus to animals. As the army gets slashed to pieces, Lamia thinks back to the garden party, a celebration of the Emperor's birthday that lasts the entire week. When she was nine, she looked everywhere for Vincent, but she couldn't find him, and when she finally did stumble upon him, he had already been speaking with Prissa. She didn't understand how, but she knew that Prissa would always be able to find Vincent, and use this in the modern day as an opportunity to fire a magic stone cannon strike at her in Vincent's battlefield. These weapons of mass destruction had been banned for their pure force, and as the haze began to clear, everyone should see why. The scale of destruction at the site of the attack should have been immense, but instead, the forest around the impact site was perfectly intact. Arakia lays on the ground, breathing out smoke, as the pruning force scrambles into plan B. An arrow suddenly approaches Lamia, but it's torn down by the Yang Sword. When she looks at the source, the siblings that had dropped out of the right of selection had all turned on her. She thought that she had finally been one step ahead of Vincent, but in reality, he had been working with Bartroy and them the whole time. She concludes that Priscilla and Vincent must have been working together the whole time as well. Belstetz, one of Lamia's commanders and the man who later becomes the Prime Minister, orders Lamia to flee, but in an instant, Cecilus catches up to her. The pruning force tries to hold Cecilus off as Lamia flees, only to once again run into Prissa with her Yang Sword. When Lamia had met Priscilla at that garden party, she knew right then and there that Priscilla was destined to be her archenemy. After that, she would regularly send assassins after her, as long as she existed. She could never bring Vincent into her fold. Arakia didn't eat the shell alone, but instead ate a chunk of a great spirit that lay dormant beneath these very lands. The boulder, Muspel. This was the name of one of the four most round spirits in the world, and if one was to consume even a fraction of them, it would protect from the stone that was fired. Vincent thinks back to Bartroy, noting he has no reason to honor a vow to a now dead man, but he also didn't have it in him to consider the matter null and void. He looks down to Arakia, nothing more than a dog 
No thoughts or opinions of her own, but surely there must be something more between her and Priscilla. He tells the young girl he would like to make her an offer from her emperor, and then we get a two month time skip. Arakia asks Prissa about the upcoming battle with Vincent, being the last remaining siblings until Chisha enters the room. His hair had turned from black to white, and offers Prissa fine wine as a congratulations for killing those who oppose her. Arakia shatters the bottle immediately on Prissa's orders, as she states that it will soon be time for them to settle things. She won't be foolish enough to drink something from him. Chisha asks her if she believes she can win, and she replies with the idea that this world bends itself to suit her. He begins to walk away before looking back and asking, if the world turns for your benefit, how does the future look to you? She looks down as Arakia drinks the wine off the floor, with tears streaming down her face. She collapses on the cusp of death, her mind racing, until Prissa rushes over and begins to draw the poison out of her mouth with her own, spitting it out mouthful by mouthful. She feels the effects of the poison taking hold instantly, but doesn't stop. Her voice is trembling as she asks how Vincent got her trusted companion to work with him, and Chisha only asks her if she really doesn't know. She let out a long sigh, but to the bitter end, she wanted to be herself. This would be the end of Prissa Benedict. Priscilla wraps up her story to Schultz, but he inquires about what happens next. She tells him there is no next. The main character died. He's unsatisfied with the conclusion, though. The princess worked so hard and tried her best only to die to treachery. He's frustrated, but also saddened by the tale. She asks what he'll do about it. Waste time complaining and be upset? He pauses for a bit, but says... In that case, he will write the rest of the story himself. It's an answer Priscilla had never expected to come from him, and I can only imagine it's one that pleases her greatly, for someone who claims to bend the construction to her will. Schult opts to live like Priscilla, to bend the narrative or the world to his will, and to keep it moving. She asks him how will it go on, and he says the princess will have gone into a deep sleep. Why would she wake up though? He replies because the princess and her dog both took half of it, and there was only enough to kill one person. He stops for a second before asking if he did something wrong by rewriting the story. And she smiles. It says an absolutely fucking fire line. Why would you be wrong? There's nothing wrong about taking a story you can't accept and bending it into a shape that suits you. I said it before and I'll say it again, this book is doing absolute wonders for Priscilla. Her dialogue throughout is fire, and this line is just incredible. The way that it's self-referential in a way about her belief that the world bends itself to her, as if the world is rewriting itself to be convenient for her. Or the general Velikian theme of inscribed fate with the observers and stargazers, or the stuff with Al that we'll get into later, and most of all, the way that Subaru does exactly this. The way Subaru acts that might displease Ode Laguna by being unhappy with the story that unfolds before him, and twisting it into a shape that suits him. Schultz continues on with his story, saying she survived and that someone very kind helped her, as she rests her chin on one hand, watching the ecstatic boy go on at length, her free hand gently brushing the cover of the book, the book that had inspired her to tell this tale. Vincent says that Prissa cannot triumph over him. However, even he does not wish to kill the little sister he loves most, and he grants Arakia a chance to save her. She wakes up with Chisha, now completely missing her left eye. It is the price she paid for survival, much as Chisha turned white as snow. If this is supposed to be taken literally, it is up in the air. He reiterates that Prissa is dead. However, the princess remains with us in this world. Arakia, however, can never see her again. She ignored the chatting of Chisha and Cecilis, and cried, and cried, and cried out to heaven. She begged what Prissa had always said would be true that the world would always bend to her, as we cut back to the girl that should be dead. She stands in a field with a grave marked Prissa Benedict, as an old woman approaches her, calling her princess. However, she refuses this title, stating Prissa is dead. She looks up at the sky, grabbing her yang sword, as a feeling of comfort overcomes her alongside the heat of the blade. She smiles and utters that the world bends itself to suit her, as Priscilla rises from the ashes. There is something interesting to note here, that EX4 and parts of EX5 basically say that Vincent is essentially the manifestation of Valakia's ideals, and that seems true in a lot of regards, however, this one act of letting Priscilla live goes completely against that. Showing mercy in the nation of harsh cruelty is not something a true Valakian would do, and I feel that his action of letting Priscilla live is something that will surely come back to bite him in the ass. Priscilla will end up in some way being the undoing of Vincent, but before we get into the future of Priscilla, we have somebody else to check in on as we descend upon an arena. A deathmatch is being held, and the first fighter is a bald man utilizing the poison hand, a technique where fighters dip their hand into poison to gather it in their fingernails, meaning the slightest scratch would kill an enemy. We are in Ginenhive, the gladiator island in Valakia, where its captives are forced to fight each other. His opponent is someone wielding a massive sword that is too heavy even for him, especially due to him only being able to make use of his right arm. 
as his left is completely missing. Al inquires if the bald man would be willing to forfeit the game, to buy time until the audience gets bored and then they send in a beast and then they can both survive. The man, however, declines, swinging at Al, hoping to give him even the mildest scratch. Al has quite accurate predictions of his moves, a swing with his right, a feint with his left that leads to a kick with his poison-covered foot. It's specified that this wasn't guesswork by Al, but he knew exactly what his opponent was going to do, calling back to him in Arc 5, referencing his potential at also being a looper like Subaru. Al ends up overcoming the poisonous obstacle and tells him he had bad luck. No, it wasn't that. His stars were bad. If you watched my Willogy video, you would remember that one of my theories on the Observers was that they are the stars of ReZero, and EX4 and 5 really made me consider this option more heavily. Stride would speak to the sky when talking to the audience, and now we learn of a position in the Empire known as Stargazers. Uh, the way they were spoken of in EX4 makes it sound as if they were used to predict the future. That's a very interesting concept considering the act of stargazing in real life is to look through time. Albeit in our world, it would mean to look into the past, as the lights we see in our night sky take time to get to us. The sun in our sky, for example, is 93 million miles away, meaning the light we see is technically 8 minutes in the past. You could also argue this would support the sort of time loop theory, where people in ReZero look into the stars to witness the threats of fate and the roles that they must act out. Now this leaves us with, your stars were bad. Most of my intrigue with this line comes from how would Al know about the importance of stars in the world? I don't believe he is quite literally in tune with the stars like a tool of the observers or a stargazer would be, but he is somehow familiar with the concept of destined fate in the ReZero world. Technically speaking, by virtue of Al being the one inscribed to die in this arena, his stars would be the one that look bad, but he uses the authority he was granted in this world to rewrite the story. The main reason why his opponent's stars were bad was solely by virtue of going up against a cheater. Al exits the arena to meet with a jailer named Orlin. Many of the guards treated the slaves with contempt, but this one, he was different. He didn't embody the unshakable conviction the Velikian Empire desires, but instead frequently shows off his compassion and empathy. A woman enters the scene, who calls Al her best friend, and is known as the Empress of the Sword Slaves. Al is not too keen on being her best friend, however, as we pan up to see an absolute force of nature known as Hornet. Standing over six feet tall with arms that don't go past her elbow, her guard gives her her arms, or rather, two immensely long swords that act as them. Al leaves with his guard, who says Hornet seems to like him, and refers to him as Aldebron but he responds to call him just Al. He is not fond of his full name. Ginan Hive lies in the western reaches of the Vlakian Empire, surrounded by a lake with the only point of entrance being a drawbridge that was usually raised. Most of the slaves here were criminals or people who had been left with no choice but to sell themselves to this life. Every once in a while, however, some unlucky person with nowhere to go would be caught and brought here. Al gets startled awake by someone, who he tells us to leave him alone as sleeping is his only pleasure. The man responds saying that there's plenty to do here and Al is very popular, pointing towards prostitutes that are also slaves on this island. Al, however, isn't interested, not because of what they do, but due to the inner turmoil of their situation. Some of them had been broken by the people they found. These were women who were given no kindness. Who was he to treat them as less than him? The man points out that Al isn't very comfortable around women, but he's always respectful. No wonder they like him. Al retorts, however, that they have no other options. The man speaking to Al is Ubilk, who has been here for five years. With no fighting skill or muscle, he survives this cruel island by also selling his body. He informs Al that there will be a major event here and bigwigs from all over the Empire attending because of the Emperor's death and his idea sends shivers down Al's spine. The idea of a huge event being held here for the spectacle of the new emperor, he could only imagine what violence that might entail. Al and nine other slaves had been pit against a demon beast in the past purely for the spectacle, with only Al and Hornet surviving. Ubilk's plan is that during the event, he will take someone important hostage and use that as a bargaining chip to demand their freedom, and he wants Al to convince Hornet to join, and this is something that pisses off Al. We cut to an old man who had served the Pendleton family for more than 50 years, and he wished nothing but happiness for his master, as a pale hand reached out for the cup he had set out. He asked the girl how she found it, the spouse of Jorah Pendleton, a man who had married a 12-year-old, something that is fairly common in medieval houses to build connections with other houses. However, even the butler was weirded out by the age gap, especially with a girl so young and with no clout that offered nothing. Jorah possessed something rare in the Empire kindness. The servant wanted to repay his master by taking in this young girl, Priscilla Pendleton. She says his tea is not bad, and it felt as if time had stopped. He shivered, a feeling of paralysis gripping his very soul. She asks the man to withdraw, wishing to speak with her husband, who tells her she has everyone quite under her thumb. She bites back, telling him not to speak to her in that raspy way, for seemingly lacking the desires and motivations almost every person naturally has. Jorah lived by simple precepts. He sought no adventure and didn't gamble, yet his marriage to Priscilla seemed to go against those principles, 
Why did he do it? She asks. She knows he is aware of her true identity, and he simply lets out a long sigh. Sometimes, she truly does act her age. She concedes, stating that it doesn't matter what he's planning anyway, for this world bends itself to suit her. As the butler barges back in to inform them that Countess Delacroix has arrived. But actually, she hasn't. Miles from EX1 and Balroy from EX4 are here on behalf of the Countess, as Jorah attempts to introduce his wife, but he seems pretty awkward about introducing his child bride. Miles and Balroy are indeed brothers, and they are here to deliver a message from Delacroix about Gladiator Island, an invitation to attend the meeting. Jorah declines the offer, but Priscilla instantly overrides him, stating that they accept and to just ignore him. He whispers, what if someone recognizes her, and she says her reason for wanting to go is her pure interest in the island, not caring about being caught. Al wakes up in shock again shuffling off to find somewhere he could be alone. He goes outside, and the plan that Ubilk had told him won't stop rattling around in his head. He looks up at the sky to see a half-full moon, but he looks beyond that and at the stars, pinpricks of light beyond counting. He stares at them before muttering, bad stars. That's what's behind it all. A half-full moon is something that is used symbolically to represent the changing of seasons, or alternatively, the ebb and tide. It's also very odd that the ReZero world would be flat, but the moon wouldn't be, and likely the stars wouldn't be either. So a half-moon is very interesting, to say the least. Priscilla finally meets with Serena Delacroix, known as the Scorching Lady, a nickname she earned after allegedly burning her father alive. The young girl looks towards the fights, stating that watching others fight for their lives and evaluating their performance is something she particularly enjoys. Serena takes a liking to the girl's Valakian attitude, as sky dragons come from above to escort them to Gideonhub Island. Not just any sky dragons, however, as they pulled a ship behind them. Ubilk excitedly talks to Al about the sky dragon ship, but he is extremely uninterested. He tells him he is lucky enough to not be fighting for his life in the arena for entertainment, but Ubilk disagrees, thinking he isn't any luckier than Al and he gets a bit irritated due to equating their struggles. He asks if he can truly ever be Al's friend if he doesn't know how to use a sword, and Al retorts to never assume he won't swing a sword. You never know what'll happen in 10 or even 20 years. And Ubilk asks him if he plans to be here for 10 more. He attempts to inspire Al to take up arms against his destiny and how he would be worth 100 men. Al, however, tells him he has nothing to do but fight and survive. And he asks him why he fights. Al says he simply has no reason to die, just like Ferris back when he was a prisoner to his father in EX1. Al gets up and enters the arena as he's showered with shouts and cheers of spectators enjoying their dark hobby. He looks towards his opponent and only mutters, neither of us are lucky, it's nobody's fault. Blame the fucking stars. Balroy, Miles, and Priscilla look down at the fights, and Priscilla is not fond of Al's method of fighting. She does not detect any attachment to his own life, thinking about what he could be fighting for. Jorah feels sick watching people kill each other, and she takes him out to get some air. Serena asks Balroy to guard them as they go to a dock looking down on the lake. The sun was already sinking, replaced in the sky by a moon red like blood. The dark lake surface reflected it, so that two moons, one in the water and one in the sky, seem to frown out at the world. In reality, a moon so red can only occur from a total lunar eclipse, something that should be impossible in the world of ReZero due to the world being allegedly flat. The reason I kind of harp on about the flat Earth and ReZero round moons and stuff like that is that Tape seems to care at least somewhat about astronomy-related stuff, as evidenced by, you know, all of the star-related themes and stuff like that. I feel like he would understand that with a flat world, a blood-red moon would be theoretically impossible, and he would understand the disconnect between a flat planet and a round moon. I personally think that there is something more going on with the world here, uh, whether it be flat or maybe just a section of the world, I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll get into that in the future. Balroy is impressed that Priscilla, being so young, isn't sick at the sight of death. Does he think she would be cuter if she squealed each time a loser died? And he says no, of course not. Priscilla looks out at the lake and says, That's odd. When did they raise the drawbridge? Until moments ago, Al had been in a fight for his life. And for the first time in a long while, Al had to resort to using multiple loops before he was able to wrest victory from his opponent. He exits the arena to find the only guard who showed compassion to him dead in a pool of his own blood, at the feet of Ubilk. Al seems frustrated at the death of this guard, mostly because killing guards is the ultimate taboo, and he has unleashed a disaster upon the island. He is well aware that he cannot defeat Al, asking why he won't help their cause. With Al, the revolution is sure to succeed. He responds that a revolution is a dream. No, it's beyond a dream. He swings at Ubilk's arm, not wanting to kill him just to disable him, but the blade gets caught by none other than Hornet. He's beyond shocked by her involvement in the revolution, assuming she had everything she could have ever wanted here. Al considers himself the poster boy for conservative lifestyles, refusing to throw away a stable life for a revolution that is sure to be crushed. This is a demonstration of a major factor of Al's character. Al is Subaru. Uh, not literally, he's more so the absolute extreme of him. They were both isekai but as Subaru thinks about the life he left behind and sheds tears over the parents he will never be able to see again, Al seemingly never speaks about his Japan life. 
They both possess the ability to loop, but as Subaru progresses, he learns to try and rely on his power less and less and value himself more. Al, however, will use as many lives as it takes, having absolutely no fear of death, something Subaru still hopes he can avoid. Not that Al enjoys death, he even says it's awful, but if it's to protect the people he loves, he will die over and over again, shooting into the thousands. Much like Subaru, Al has also pledged complete loyalty to a woman he had just met. There's also some connection to Satella, but we'll get to that later. Finally, when Al says he lives a conservative lifestyle, he really does mean that always preferring to stick to the status quo in fear that his quality or standard of living will be shaken. He wants to live life as easy as possible, attempting to fight the beast instead of killing that man at the start of the book, avoiding the revolution, attempting to avoid combat in Pristella in Arc 5. Al just wants to relax. He's someone who wishes to be devoid of any of his own agency, reminiscent to Subaru in the parent and child episode, staring at the clock until it was too late to go to school. Al is Subaru had he gone down the wrong path in this world, the Subaru who operates with reckless abandon for his own sanity, who never learned that sometimes it's okay to put yourself before others, and the Subaru that never learned he deserves to be saved. Al attempts to challenge Hornet, and dies, and dies, and dies again. He tries to incorporate each thing he learned from previous loops, but it's really no use and his last option is to just run. Entering the main arena and noticing that palpable tension and fear had filled the building. As rebellious sword slaves had taken over, he stands stunned. Ubilk had truly taken over Gladiator Island to fight the Empire. His dream was approaching. Priscilla and them run back to Serena, noting that something is wrong, but notice the uprising that had occurred. The slaves are looking for Serena, and Priscilla informs them that she is Serena Delacroix, much to her party's shock. The rebels deny it, but Priscilla interjects, telling him she cares not what he thinks. Does she look like some young fool playing at being a high countess, or someone who needs the validation of some common nickname when she is a member of nobility? The man in front of her stiffened, as he gazed into her eyes detecting not a trace of fear. He apologizes to the countess, and says their leader wishes to meet with her. Jor demands he accompany her and she approves, stating that he would simply shout and struggle. Priscilla and Jorah are taken to the room of the man who runs the island, who had been gutted like a pig as Ubilok stands before them. He states that he hopes to use her as a hostage to negotiate with Vlachia, to give the island independence and to free the slaves. Vincent however, has already assembled a response force with no intent on negotiation, with no pretense of saving hostages, purely to destroy. Orbart, one of the Divine Generals, was with a young woman known as Arakia, headed to the Gladiator Island. The lake surrounding the prison is filled with aquatic demon beasts to keep them from escaping. However, it now makes getting to the island quite difficult. Arakia states that she will go regardless, and Orbart doesn't want to let a young girl throw her life away, but Arakia eats a lesser water spirit to literally become the water. She notices a very small island, or more so a collection of rocks, picking up the scent of blood. Rushing towards it, she finds a man who says he knows a silver-haired girl didn't fight him with his karma. She asks him if he doesn't want to die, but he says nothing. She will heal him in exchange for information. Chuckling to himself, he mutters that he isn't afraid of dying after all this. Priscilla is, unsurprisingly, unamused with the slave's goals. Declaring Ubilk one of the less stupid people here, he should know that they have zero chance. One of the rebels cuts her off, saying that the Empire would send help, but she rejects that notion. It goes against the very essence of Valakia. Ubilok tries to calm down his party after that bombshell, saying Priscilla is only trying to rattle them. Persistence and greed are their bread and butter. She and Jorah both know that independence for the island is merely a cover, and Ubilok must have some other goal. Arakia performs basic first aid on Al, who utters that he might just be in hell, as he sees a silver-haired girl when he's about to die. Al and Satella, of course, have some connection here. Three out of four isekai people that we're aware of do which lets us infer that it's likely Satella has something to do with being isekai in the first place. Satella says to Subaru that she wants him to kill her, and we have this Al third trial quote from Arc 4, where he rambles on about being so sorry he can't kill someone because he's weak, and that someone will be alone for all of eternity, repeatedly apologizing for his weakness. It seems Al has some horrible memories about silver hair, saying it reminds him he's a useless piece of trash, and how he wasn't able to help someone important to him when it mattered the most. Al accepts his role to help Arakia lower the drawbridge to let the army in. The rebels attempt to intimidate Priscilla, but she is indomitable. She says they let that rabble rouser dictate everything, being led along by his hand, stabbing them right where it hurts, as they come down from the high of capturing the island. She tells them that they can continue to be led by the nose and get snuffed out trying to challenge the Divine Generals, or they can struggle against their own destiny, as Ubilk calls her to join him on the balcony. He points out the troops ready to mobilize, and lifts up his shirt revealing an eye on his chest. He is a member of the Demon Eye clan, but notes that isn't why the master of the island liked him, and Priscilla references his occupation, which he feels embarrassed about. The young girl, however, tells him he has nothing to be ashamed of. All life seeks to carve a place for itself using the abilities it has, and if you carved yours without a weapon, then you must have done it by wits. That shows you are not a beast, but a human. He refers to her as clever, and informs her that he is aware of her true identity, which Priscilla does not fight back on at all. She's taken away with Jorah, and he knows he has something that will foil the Emperor's own generals, their own Empress. How does Ubilk know her true identity? 
That much is unknown, whether it be related to his demon eye, or perhaps he too speaks with the stars. Somehow, he knows of Prissa Benedict. Arakia and Al wash up on the island's trash heap, filled with rotten food, human shit, and corpses for the demons. Some people even buy the corpses if they're pretty enough, as he had heard of people buying the bodies of rare demi-humans to stuff them. This should sicken a man, but Al is indifferent. When he's dead, he's dead, something that stands in stark contrast to Subaru's view on death. Arakia consumes a wind spirit, becoming totally invisible. They work towards the tower to lower the drawbridge, killing guards on the way there until they see the back of the hornet. Seeing even her back sends Al into a panic as he sulks into the shadows. He could face suffering hundreds, even thousands of times, as long as he knew it would end eventually. But what if it never ended? Al Dobron knew that in this world, there were some enemies that could not be defeated. Al tells the girl he is not going any further, and she understands. He attempts to convince her that it's not worth it, that Hornet is the third strongest being he has ever encountered, all three of them making his heart feel as if it were freezing solid, but she just wouldn't listen. He had no desire any longer to spend himself trying to bend the wills of others. That is why he let the girl go to a battle in which he knew that she would die. Something deep within him ached, like a tremendous weight was going to crush his heart. If this was a symptom of the stress of facing something difficult to bear, then why was he standing here, watching something he didn't want to see? His spirit was broken. He couldn't even dream. He had no reason to fight and nothing that would drive him to win. No motivation at all to struggle against anything, and yet... Al enters the room holding a mere dagger after watching Arakia get pummeled, and Hornet is impressed by his hot-bloodedness. But no, the sight of her blood on that silver hair made him sicker than he expected, and his stars were... No, not his stars. His temper was bad today. Al thinks of a one-armed swordsman with a blood-soaked girl with him, like something out of a heroic legend or a saga. If it hadn't have been him here, but someone more powerful or handsome, the moment could have been the subject of a painting. Hornet, literally missing two arms, but has turned that into her strength. You could argue this serves as some interesting reflection on Al and his self-perceived strength, missing, well, half of the arms Hornet is, and being significantly weaker than her. In the ten years that he had spent on Gladiator Island, Al had never once enjoyed a fight. He simply couldn't. He didn't have it in him to be happy at taking another's life. In an instant, his weapon was swept away, along with his torso, and Al died. Priscilla says the poison should be taking effect by now. Not literal poison, but the droplets of it that she had sown throughout the rebellion, sapping their very vitality. Discord brewed amongst them, as bodies began to fall as Balroy came to retreat Priscilla. She knows that the real aim of the disturbance is the Emperor's head, to bring the Divine Generals to the island and leave Vincent unprotected. Balroy, shocked, retorts that one or two of them being gone wouldn't open him up to assassination, but she responds with the idea that there is more uprisings around the nation. The rebellion begins to panic even more. What they had signed up for was liberation, not assassination. No matter what Al did, he died. His head was crushed, his torso split open, his legs cut off, his arms broken, his innards spilled all over the ground. He repeats and he repeats, constantly dying to Hornet. Whenever he found himself confronted by people like this, he understood he could never be like them. The strong were strong because they were born strong. To Al, there was nothing more and nothing less to life than this. As we see the inner monologue of Al getting massacred, what Arakia sees is a man who shouldn't be holding his own holding his own and standing up to the force of nature known as the Empress of the Sword Slaves. Arakia moves even a muscle, and Hornet whips around in an attempt to instantly kill her when suddenly, a voice echoes through the island. There is no future for your uprising. Your leader seeks the Emperor's head. This talk of freedom is nothing but a diversion. You've been had. Only death awaits you fools. However, your new Emperor is not without mercy. If you show the proper attitude, he may reconsider your fate. This is such a twisted version of Subaru's Arc 5 speech, and it's fantastic. What he did served to inspire hope, as Priscilla tears down their hopes of liberation and sends them into further panic. Hornet does not care about killing the Emperor, and reveals she is only here as a test of strength against the Divine Generals. Al is sort of stunned, telling her that she should know she's not really the strongest in the world, and how the strongest person on this planet is walking around Lagunica with an elementary schooler's backpack. She, however, expects and even desires to die here in this battle. Falling gloriously in battle is what she swears by. Al is not fond of her goals, as he begins to scratch at his neck with his own blade. He thinks everyone reads too much into dying. It's ridiculous. Death isn't salvation, it's painful and sad. As Arakia gets back to her feet, Priscilla, Miles, and Balroy go on a killing spree to retrieve Jora. as Al and Arakia begin their second round against Hornet. If he hits her foot with a twig, there's a 60% chance she destroys the bridge. When the bridge comes down, the girl saves him 100% of the time. When he charges in the moment she starts her sword dance, he dies. If he watches, he dies. If he tries to run away, a little over 70% of the time, the girl and him will turn out to not be on the same page. It's all trial and error, 
and he tells Hornet he has died here 713 times, counting the first battle in the arena 792 times. He asks her if he can see the god of death he is stuck with. She can't see anything at all, but the idea of killing Al 800 times is like a dream come true. She has enough of this worthless chit chat, but he tells her it wasn't worthless, as she collapses and succumbs to poison. Al had Arakia burn the body of the poison hand shinobi, which carried his poison into the wind and made her breathe it in. Even if the poison hadn't worked, Al still had ideas to kill her, bring down the whole island, crush her with the bridge, maybe even 10 other ideas. She asks him to finish her, but he refuses. He's seen movies, he knows what someone might do if you get too close to them at their last moment. So he stands there and watches Hornet succumb to the poison. The drawbridge was lowered and defeat was assured. However, true defeat came when Priscilla had given her speech. Orbart thanks Al for helping lower the bridge, asking if he has any desires that the Emperor can help with. He says, the world is a big place, and the island has been enough for him. Orbart tells him that young people are supposed to have dreams, and he only replies that he already had himself a good one. He dreamed he was able to protect a silver-haired young lady. It was the thing he had to do in all of his lives. He has no wishes. He has no plans to leave. Most of the people he knew were now dead, minus Ubluk who had escaped, and considered Priscilla to be a cruel woman. Priscilla thanks Serena on behalf of her and her husband for this exciting excursion, and the Emperor remains undisturbed despite Ubluk's plan. Serena does not like owing people, and asks what Priscilla might want, but she does not ask for anything in particular at this time. Al steps back into the Gladiator Island, being given his sword, thinking about the deceased Orlin. Everything changed. Nothing lasted. Everything would fade in time. The ants would wail and cry, but they couldn't stop the river's flow. He enters the arena, and his opponent is one of the rebels from the uprising. He doesn't know how he was alive, but he was. Gajit would have to kill Al. Al would have to kill him first. It was just an unlucky star. Jorah was approached with a marriage proposal from a local noble who had insisted he consider a marriage with his granddaughter. He was pushing 50, and the girl was only 12. He had no desire to inflict the unhappiness of such a marriage on someone so young, but he was prepared to support her to help her find a suitable marriage match. She immediately informs Jorah of her origin, and his role was one to protect this very vulnerable young girl. She only takes interest in his possessions, seeking the knowledge hidden within the old family library of his. Jorah was the epitome of the kind of person who was unsuited to be a member of Imperial nobility, only seeking to safeguard the house for the next generation. He realized that every time he saw her, she was reading. Storing up knowledge was essential, carrying her to higher and higher places, raising and refining her very existence. Priscilla had given Jorah words to say, a part to play as a main character in her life despite being a small, trivial man. He felt no quiver in his heart, even as guards surrounded his house, calling him for treason. Soldiers of the Divine General, Gauz Ralphone, surrounded his home. With Jorah's feeble arm, he will resist them as he falls to Gauze's golden army to buy Priscilla time to escape. She flees, being grabbed by none other than Arakia. Priscilla refers to her as a traitor, stating that her own existence threatens Vincent's entire facade of an emperor. Arakia calls out to Prissa, but she isn't Prissa. Her name is Priscilla, and she reaches out towards the Yang Sword, stating that her wielding this very blade is a threat to Vincent. Arakia, clenching her teeth, yells at Priscilla to go, so that they may never meet again. EX5 has slightly irked out a victory over EX1 for me. There's so much cool symbolism and so many interesting themes that carry this book just a bit over as one of my top two side stories. Uh, the amount of extra characterization we get from Priscilla and Al is just fantastic, and Valakia as a nation by far holds my interest the most. The only thing I don't like about EX5 was Arakia. She's not too bad as a character, she just kind of falls into ReZero's female character pitfall of like, existing entirely for somebody else while also having one of the worst designs on the face of the earth. We see it in Arc 5 with Liliana and Kiritaka and her awful design, we see it in Arc 6 with someone I won't mention for spoilers sake and her awful design, and now we get Arakia's awful design, existing only for Priscilla. And I'm just not interested in her. But it's not enough to drag EX5 down entirely, so now we're standing at Battle Ballad, EX5, EX1, EX2, EX4, and EX3. Priscilla looks down in her wide yard, with a stone stage in the middle. She looks down, stating there is quite a nice collection of fools who think too highly of themselves. An exhibition match competing in martial arts is taking place down below on the stage. It's stained with blood and sweat, yet she looks unamused. Everyone in the crowd notices this, looking up at her. Her current husband, Lip Bariel, tells her to stop showing her face to them. She retorts, however, that she opened this event for herself, and if she were not to observe it, how would the zeal of the commoners be rewarded? Lip is frustrated, grinding his teeth. There was not a trace of bond or affection between them, a relationship built entirely on necessity. He yells at his wife about not understanding the importance of choosing a knight. The dignity of knighthood is directly connected to the evaluation of his master's person, 
but she says she will do exactly what she pleases, and only join his plot because it does not go against her whims. If one were to become Priscilla's knight, as she is married to Lip, who holds a key position in Lagunica, surely they would receive great benefits. Normally, picking a knight would only be reserved for being part of the royal guard, but Priscilla opted to test people without official positions. Unfortunately, though, her expectations were not met. There was no one in this crowd that makes her heart dance. Just as she was about to give in to boredom, she stopped. Something caught the corner of her eye. Why did this simple man catch her attention? It's because the moment he appeared, the roar of the crowd ceased, as if it had been doused with water. His lack of an arm also interested her. It would be nothing of note walking around the town, but here, at a martial arts competition, it's quite unique. She looks terribly pleased, giving off an unordinary air of passion, sending everyone away only to leave Al. Lip is, of course, pissed off, but Priscilla says her correctness will be proven by Providence. Al is a bit nervous, saying he hopes he didn't come to the wrong place, and Lip yells at him as well for disrespecting his wife, before Priscilla tells him to pipe down. Al asks what he can show her that would make her approve of him, and she says one thing, and one thing only. Survive. Her fan gets thrown at Al at blazing speeds, blocking his vision, and she runs up and pulls his sword out, chopping his own head off. Or, so she thought. Yet Al stands there alive, asking if she plans on trying that again. She concludes that she has seen all that she needs to see with that one swing. She asks why he isn't taking off his helmet in her presence, and he only replies that it is a face he cannot show. She asks him if he has prepared for the rough road ahead to become ruler of Lagunica, and he says, of course, how about her? But she is not worried, as this world was designed to operate in a way that suits her. There's a couple of super short side stories that give us a little bit more about Al that I will touch on briefly before we get into the much larger stories. These will be Al Visual Complete, which isn't much besides that we find out Al does eventually leave the island, thanks to a guard, and he also gave him a custom-built black helmet, a copy of one of the heroes of the Colosseum that they wear on a statue. The guard speaks about how he could use the helmet to get a lot of money to top up on his travel expenses, but it would be funny if he didn't sell it. In the second one, Ram's Floating Refusal, Ram is looking around Lagunica for Emilia. However, someone calls out to her, namely Al. She says she's too busy to talk, and Al says he's looking for someone too, asking if she has seen Priscilla. She replies no and tries to ignore him, but as she turns to leave, he says, Bye, Ram, which catches her off guard given that she never gave him her name. What's even more strange than Al knowing Ram's name is that on the same day she first meets Al, Ram also meets Subaru for the first time, as the end of this side story is her finding Amelia holding the hand of Subaru. What is Al cooking? I don't know. A star destined to follow the Pleiades through the heavens, chasing the seven sisters across our star-filled sky for millennia. However, a change is rapidly approaching the follower. The burial domain has been beaten down, holding quite the poor opinion of their ruler, Lip Burial, but being unable to fight back against him, having been crushed every attempt for the past decade. On their glum, dreary fields, however, the sun begins to shine. Sunlight that is so bright, representing life, energy, power, and clarity. A natural force that is so powerful, it is outside of our control. The shining light, known as Priscilla Burial. She comes into town and criticizes the commoners, attacking them, but not the farms they own. She tells them they hold ambition unsuited to the limits of their form, and announces who she really is. The commoners are defeated having been biding their time for Lip's death, only to now encounter his successor. She picked out one man in his farm, and their worry would suddenly vanish exactly one month later, when an impossibly abundant harvest appeared. The villagers, all with cheerful faces, now unanimously honor and praise her divine existence, giving her the nickname of the Sun Princess. She tells them as long as they continue to bow before her glory, she would not be so cruel as to deprive them of her compassion. Al cringes. It had only been a few days that the two had known each other. Priscilla appeared thoughtful, but would immediately put her impulses into action. She seemed approachable, but you would then suddenly see a cruel expression on her face. He thinks of her as a witch, getting lost in thought after asking Schult what he thought of the princess. He of course sings her praises, but also asks Al if he can be trusted as her ally. He responds, well, if you ask him like that, of course he would say yes. It's not an appropriate question. Schult does feel a bit hurt by this response, but Al is unbothered. For the sake of his goal, he discards everything else. Priscilla barges in, stating Schultz's only role is to be there when she wishes, and failing that is inexcusable. Al shrugs, saying that she's dealing with a kid and to take some weight off his shoulders. She responds, however, that the uncertainty of the world rains down on everyone, adult or child. Her expression changes in an instant, stating that all lives are equal besides herself, as this world is designed to operate in a way that best works for her. Al mutters, calling her mean, shaking his head in disapproval. She bites back, calling him a rude man, and immediately changes the conversation to ask Al how his plotting is coming around. He chuckles, so she noticed he was sniffing around. Her eyes and ears are more capable than others. Not only that, but she knows what is occurring in her own domain and garden. He asks if his snooping has upset her, but she's unbothered. The moment she invited a brigand inside, this sort of trifle was expected. 
To believe he had already given her his loyalty with all of his heart would be foolish. We cut to the study in the mansion, as a particular scent wafts through the room, a smell Al is not keen on. He's having a meeting with Lip, someone who he should respect, but in truth, he didn't think of him as the least bit worthy of it. Lip asks what Al thinks of that woman wandering around the domain, and Al thinks she is quite the inquisitive one. No matter where they go, no matter the condition of the soil, the princess brings results. Lip is unhappy, referring to her as the Bloody Bride, Despite her not even being 20 yet, this is her 8th marriage, with every single spouse meeting their end. Lip reveals he purely married her for her status as a candidate in the royal selection, but she is unpredictable, so he desires to surround her with people he can't predict. He asks Al to make sure she remains healthy, and has invited a knight called Gillian to meet with her. He refers to Priscilla as the incarnation of beauty from above, and she allows Gillian to touch her skin, reaching out for him to kiss the back of her hand. He has been invited to accompany Priscilla's travels around the domain, but she already has her jester Al. She changes her mind rather quickly though, stating that it might be nicer to have a man that isn't wearing a clunky iron helmet. They head out, and Lip finally breathes a sigh of relief. They return to the study, being the only allegedly safe room, prepared for secret discussions. Lip talks about his hatred for the Sage Council, namely Mickletop and Bordeaux. Al inquires as to how they found out Priscilla was even eligible to be a candidate, and Lip kind of changes his attitude suddenly and tells him he has no obligation to tell him, which is interesting. He intends for Gillian to act as Priscilla's knight, and Al is like, Hey, what about me? He tells him he will just make up a position in the mansion for him, but the citizens need a simple and easy to understand image as Priscilla's knight. But Al says that the people of the domain have seen Priscilla with him. They already know he's her knight. At the very least, Al and Schultz, who is also in on this plan, feel comfortable knowing that at the end of the day, Lip's goals align with theirs. Getting Priscilla into the throne is what matters at the end of the day. However, Lip has to immediately break this harmony by revealing his intention of cursing her and turning her into his puppet. The room freezes, but Lip continues talking. He finds her troublesome willfulness obnoxious, and has made contact with someone who knows a shaman to place the curse. Schultz lashes out because Lip said he wouldn't harm the princess. It's not harming though, it's controlling, so what's the problem? The grown man begins to verbally attack Schultz, saying he has been drawn in by that clump of flab. Schultz getting worked up and being, well, just a kid, tries to hit the man, but it's obviously ineffective. Lip returns with a hit that's two, no, three times as hard and mocks the boy while he's on the ground, telling him that he will now burn to death. His innards will char, and you'll blow smoke from every hole in your body. The intensifying mana made the air in the study shimmer. But the moment before Schultz would have been burnt to ashes, Al's sword had been unleashed. What is the meaning of this? The old man asks. And Al isn't sure why he did it either. He tells the boy it's okay to cry if it hurts, and he'll keep it a secret. Schultz asks Al if he likes Priscilla too, and he hesitates calling himself so, so dumb. How did he miss something so simple? There's no way he could happily plot with an old geezer who can't see how sexy the princess is, as he immediately blocks a hit from Lip, telling Schultz to run. Al quickly judges he is at a disadvantage, stating, however, that the conditions are met. Before the fight continues, he tells Lip his luck. No, his stars were bad. Lip immediately blasts him using a meteor, blowing Al to pieces. As his body scatters across the room, Lip prepares to chase after Schultz, but he only hears one phrase inside of the study. Your stars were bad. He whips back around, killing Al again, and hears that his stars were bad once more. He repeats this process over, and over, and over again. Lip grows more and more confused as the man he has seen himself kill over and over again only gets back up. Al says Lip is looking tired, and that he doesn't know how many times he's done this, but surely he hasn't given up after a few dozen. He also states he himself must be the attacker in this situation. Lip begins to whimper, please, please kill me. His head flies off of his shoulders before he comes back to life once more hearing all about his stars. The old man's nightmare did not end, as Al seemingly toys with him. Eventually, he drags Lip out of the study, feeling mildly repulsed at what he'd done. After so many stories, we can finally infer what Al's ability does. First of all, conditions must be met. What those are seem to be unclear, but it's possible it has to do with range or scope of the area he's in. Perhaps a room must be small enough. Seemingly, if Al is the victim, like with Capella in Arc 5 and Horna in EX5, he resets the entire domain that he had set, essentially acting as Return by Death Light. However, if Al is the attacker, it seems more like particular things can be reset. Al's body returns in front of the viewer, not resetting the entire room, and even Lip was killed at least once before being brought back. However, when Al is the attacker, it seems he loses any and all memory of what is occurring. Why would this be? An initial theory with Return by Death is that when Subaru dies, that world line continues and he just goes to another one where he's still alive. There are some details later on in the story that could possibly contradict this and imply he's quite literally resetting the clock. Al's, however, functions entirely differently. Perhaps those world lines do exist and Subaru just doesn't utilize them. The Al's that appear as the attacker could literally be Al's from a different world line, as they seem pretty confused when they appear. That's just a theory though, let me know what you guys think. Priscilla returns to the mansion with Gillian, and they see Al dragging Lip. Gillian gets ready for battle, saying he will not allow him to direct his poison fangs at Priscilla. As Gillian notes Al's disadvantage, 
Al also notes that the conditions are not met, but Priscilla solves this by striking Gillian down with her Yang Sword. She considers him a boring man, because she does not want unchanging days of serenity, as unchanging things are simply tiresome. Gillian then bursts into flames. Priscilla was aware of Lip's plan the entire time, and before one feels annoyance at the insect buzzing around one's ear, it's only natural to take away the insect's wings and legs. Schultz walks up to Priscilla, glad she is unharmed, and she allows the crying boy to get her dressed dirty. She looks up towards Al, saying he was wise to choose her. He replies, however, it was a no-brainer to choose between an old guy and a sexy girl. Lip had been absolutely mind-fucked by Al, and is now unfit to carry the domain, and Priscilla takes up the mantle of the burial domain. The Priscilla stories and Vlakian stories are generally about destined fate, so Al breaking from his casted role as a follower to instead make his own decisions here just fucking hits, as Al is seemingly breaking from the script. The themes play heavily into astrotheology or star worship. Generally, this showed up in real life as people worshipping planets as deities, but at the current time we're unsure if the Rizio universe has other worlds in its sky, but it's something that has been observed for centuries. A lot of early Egyptian star worship is centered around Sirius, or in a grander scheme, the Winter Triangle, containing Sirius, Orion, and Betelgeuse. Of course, the Orion constellation consists of the Aldebaran star, and Orion in mythology was a giant huntsman, and in one telling of his story, he had fallen in love with the Pleiades Seven Sisters, and when he attempted to pursue them, Zeus had scooped them up and placed them in the sky. In the early afternoon, it all started with a declaration that came out of nowhere. Priscilla is bored, and Al is forced to commence something that interests her. He looks up at the sky as a harsh gust of wind comes and blows him over the balcony railing. He grabs onto something and pulls himself up before he realizes that what he had grabbed onto was Priscilla. She flicks his hand off, throwing him back over as he lands into a small pond. He sinks into the water and can just barely make out Schultz's cries of concern, wondering what the heck he's even doing. He thrusts back to the surface of the water, trying to wring out his clothes, and asks what the citizens would think of her trying to kill her own knight. They would just believe her instead of him, as she holds back Schultz from trying to help Al dry himself off. Al stares at her shining radiance through his helmet, and I think it's quite funny that Al is really the only person who kind of sees Priscilla's true character, uh, minus Lip, God rest his soul, and he is the one who wears the helmet. It's as if the helmet acts as a way to dim the brightness to see the true person underneath. She is once again bored, being only mildly entertained by Al falling into a pond, and tells Al as her gesture he must now dance atop a fire, and tells Schultz to tell her a story. The boy brings up a rumor he had heard, a village down south where people go missing, referring to it as the Nightmare of La Rima. Priscilla says that will be enough to relieve her boredom, and Al gets a bad feeling. In what seems like an instant, they arrive in the very quiet village where people live their lives with little change. Al begins to concoct an investigation plan which is immediately shattered by Priscilla, as they turn to Schultz who is reading a book. A book that Priscilla had given him in an effort to have him remember every story so he can recite them to her when she is bored. Al informs the townsfolk that they are here to investigate the disappearances, and he is aired, so that they can ask if she is truly the Sun Princess. She confirms and they feel their prayers have been answered. People are repeatedly getting lost at the spring, and the forest becomes foggy, isolating rescue parties. Some people do make it back, and they report meeting with the dead once the fog rolls in. Priscilla wants to enter immediately, and the townspeople warn her not to go, offering to be her meat shield, until Al talks them down and tells her that they should start heading in. They slash their way through dense foliage, and Al asks if it would have been better to leave Schultz behind and out of the danger zone, but Priscilla tells him to stop thinking with his dick. He says they can just torch the forest, evaporating the springs, but it's met with harsh criticism, a lowly, wretched reason for a forest fire, despite her love of flames. They get to talking about the dead, and Al asks her if she has anyone she would want to meet, but the only person who has died recently is her husband, Lip Beriel, who Al says isn't dead. Schult is a bit frightened, saying Lip was a bad person, right? Al responds that the opposite of justice is another type of justice. Lip, however, was not just, but neither are they. Schult says that he will pray for his soul, and Al is at least happy that one person would earnestly mourn for him. Priscilla notes that Al seems to reject the idea of meeting the dead, and he agrees. If you die, it's over. You can't meet the dead. She seems to agree with that appraisal, but says maybe it's more he has someone he doesn't want to meet. Al grinds his teeth in anger thinking about that prospect as the fog rolls in and Al is alone. He cuts through the fog before a voice mutters, who is it? Causing him to stop in his tracks. It was the voice of a man. As he turned around, Lip Bariel rushed towards him, and before he could spit out more vitriol, Al cuts him down, demanding the forest at least to bring the dead to him. He encounters many of the fallen from Gladiator Island, and his body remembers exactly what strikes were coming from them. Suddenly, the being that was supposed to be constructed by the white fog was pitch black, slender limbs cloaked by the color of darkness. What was replicated was a forbidden being who shouldn't have been there. Al collapses, seeing Satella, realizing the fog replicates the people its target had a connection to. This, this was breaking the rules. This transcended life and death. This was a blasphemous act against everything that ever existed, unexplainable, vicious fury flared up from within Al, making him let out a shout that was driven by his raging emotions. He kicks up the slasher, but his knees give out. 
His voice chokes up, and his teeth chatter. His voice cracks, trying desperately to gain distance, until the figure is pierced by a crimson sword. At first, Al is angry, but he's snapped out of it by Priscilla as the fog clears, and Schult has banished the evil. The water mirror was sunken into the lake. He was told by the book which was full of anecdotes like this one. He had shattered the mirror and the fog disappeared. Out of sheer generosity, the spirit that deserved to die 10,000 times was killed only once. The villagers were able to retrieve the bodies of their lost, and upon hearing the news of this, Priscilla had already forgotten that they went out to help. The illusions of the forest didn't work on Priscilla and Schultz because they had nobody they had wanted to meet. As Al looked over at the flowers the villagers had given them, they are known as Kudanai flowers. Kudanai in Japanese meaning deep red or crimson. Priscilla had only taken action because she knew that they grew these red flowers. The burial mansion is bustling, as the people of the domain crowd around the entrance. Al stands there, glad to not be called a knight, as that means he is not a target of gossip. He turns around to see Ye, a servant of the house. If this mansion is this busy, with so many people offering gifts and an audience with the princess, why is Ye not down there working? She vents there is no end to them, and she wants to work for the amount she gets paid, but also it's an opportunity for the other maids to grow. Suddenly, tons of noise come from the entrance hall, as a young man pushes his way through, yelling out to meet with Priscilla, as his hometown had been swarmed by the undead. Al attempts to prod the man for information, but he's so shaken he can't speak. Priscilla yells at him for keeping his lips shut, asking him how his heart would feel. He saw the villagers' limbs falling apart, yet they were being sewn back together. They spotted him, and he ran for his life, reaching the mansion. He pleads with her to slaughter the puppets of his family, which puts a smile of satisfaction on her face. Unlike the town they had visited prior, this place has no specialties, so Al is curious as to why she is going. She won't tell him, though, making him find the reason for himself, or he will be treated even worse. If a penalty exists, however, he would like a reward too, so she says that he can lick her feet but he wasn't exactly sold on that. In a rare turn of events, Priscilla had left Schult behind and brought Ye. When they arrive at the village, they see nothing but farms and fields. They notice villagers living their lives, and Ye points out that the corpses risen during the demi-human civil war could not operate like this. Al interjects, stating that it could be worse. At least they got to die. Priscilla during this is silent, however. She smells and hears something that she deems an act of insolence against her. As a man comes to welcome them to the town, she pulls out her yang sword and cleaves him in two. She continues on, slaughtering townsfolk left and right, and her deduction is correct. Tentacles squirm around inside one of the dead men, like roots of a plant, like weeds that danced around underwater. She gets tired of it, however, leaving it to Al and Ye, who are not thrilled. Al is certain he will die, like, for real die, but after a few seconds, he is saved by Priscilla. The way she makes her decisions is extremely interesting. She's an abundant force of nature. Like our very sun, her presence brings life, like in the previous story with the farms, as if her very existence lets off the sun's radiance. Much like the sun, however, you will feel its harsh cruelty as you get up close. When you keep your distance, she does noble acts for little reward, like ending the fog that causes townsfolk to disappear. But when you get up close, you see she does it for her own amusement, to sustain herself for just a bundle of flowers. Ye retrieves the women and children that had been forced to stay inside, and a girl asks if the man who escaped is safe. Priscilla says yes, and she will reward her for helping him survive, locking lips with the girl and biting down on a tentacle inside of her mouth, dragging the appendage out of the girl's body as it lays on the ground flopping like a fish out of water. These aren't traditional zombies, but instead parasitic creatures, and for some reason, they are incapable of controlling women and children. Priscilla pulls out the Yang Sword, utilizing its ability to cut what it wants to cut to only destroy the parasites inside of the townsfolk, and leaving them unharmed. She believes a nearby river is the source of the infection, having her army investigate three other nearby villages. She for once seems enraged on behalf of others, sending shivers down Al's spine. Whoever it is, they shall pay the price of their act of folly. It was discovered that two other villages were indeed infected. Strangely enough, not all three, meaning that must be the source of the parasite as it is a town that utilizes a water mill that is likely being used to poison the river. Priscilla meets with the owner of the water mill, Etta, and inquires about the scheme. Upon questioning, the floor disappears, and Al falls through. He remains helpless as he plunges down into the deep, dense shadow. Etta calls Priscilla careless, and she is not amused, appraising her of being worthy of 10,000 deaths. Two zombies come out to attack her, but Ye throws kunai at them and kills them instantly. Not just the zombies, though, Etta as well. Despite her state of death, Priscilla does not stop talking to her, and Etta keeps responding. She didn't drop Priscilla down with Al because she wants to maintain her perfect body, as Ye falls back to search for the possibly dead Al. Priscilla pulls out her Yang Sword, but for some reason, its usual shining brilliance has been clouded over, being released back into the sky. Priscilla is nigh defenseless. Al is in a dark and muddy place, landed on top of a mountain of rotting bodies. As he ponders his situation, zombies begin to shamble towards him. Before he can act, bodies begin to fall on onto the mountain as Ye up above kills more, and Al makes a break for it. He notes he doesn't know the width or length of this place, meaning he can't utilize his power, so my speculation about size restrictions was probably correct. As zombies approach him, he tries for it anyway, yelling for his domain to expand as the space around him contorts. Etta offers her alcohol, clearly a trap that 
Priscilla accepts, shocking even Etta. But Priscilla returns to her line of comfort. This world is made to suit her, and Etta will meet her end, no matter how much effort she puts in. Yay finds Al in the sewers below, completely spent, as if he'd been down here for hours, surrounded by the undead that have returned to the earth. She says that she was ordered to find him, and upon hearing that, Al stands back up, going where Ye came from. She tries to get him to stop, but he refuses, as the princess would never make a fruitless move, because this world bends itself to suit her. Ye yells out to him that there's tons of enemies out there, and he'll be fighting 100 to 1, but he will do it no matter what, as long as the possibility isn't zero. His inspiration is at an all-time high, knowing that Priscilla thought he would be the one to shift the deadlock on the board. Suddenly, Etta appears, lunging towards Al, as he laments that the stars were not in his favor. He returns to Priscilla victorious, having left Etta alive for her to finish something that quite pleases her. Etta can only lay there and chatter her teeth at the horrible experience of battling Al, as she is put out of her misery. He inquires as to what Priscilla will do about the parasite inside of her, and she says that she will kiss him to get rid of it. All is well once again in the Priscilla camp, and Ye is out during the night, walking towards the princess's bedroom. Al tells her that is enough. She remarks how difficult it will be now with him in the picture, and that he can come with her if he'd like, but he is steadfast in his protection of Priscilla. Ye says that she thought she did a good job hiding it, and Al confirms that she did, but he is the one who is cheating. She throws a blade right at him, hitting him in the chest and killing him. But when she turns around, a blade is drawn at her neck. He tells her that he cheated, and that Priscilla chose him, so he will choose her. She is the woman who will kill Priscilla, and he won't let her do it twice. Confused, she says that she hasn't succeeded, and he affirms this. To set that in stone, he will nip what is uncertain in the bud. The stars were not in our favor. A stench of blood and booze mixed together in a room with destroyed shelves and splintered ceramics with crude swords and bloodstained cudgels. A fight had taken place here. There was not a beautiful thing in this room, so when Priscilla had walked in, she stuck out like a sore thumb. You would reckon the world had messed up casting her role. In the room, human remains litter the ground, their limbs cleave, their inners removed, and a lake of blood sits throughout. A voice says a woman shouldn't be coming into a place like this. He was a tall man drunk on blood and booze. She tells him not to treat her like a village girl. He readies his sword, calling her a phantom woman leaping towards her with his blade only to have it clank off one of her fans. Faster than his eye can move, Priscilla hits him three times around the room. She points out his disrespect, telling him to thank his lucky stars. She slams her heel on his head as Al walks in, asking how things ended up like this. Reckoning that the man will die, asking Priscilla to take her foot off of him. She lets the man choose, hanged to death or decapitation. The man is Heinkel Astrea, and upon this declaration, Al stops fiddling with his helmet. He repeats, he is an Astrea. You know what that means, right? She asks what meaning that name is supposed to have to her, as no matter what his name is, and no matter whose father he is, that shall not sway her choices. Al says that they'll be in big trouble if they execute the Sword Saint's father, and Priscilla asks him if he thinks she'd lose. He doesn't think she would, but he and Schultz certainly would. Heinkel begins to panic when his status doesn't save his life, and Al informs him that she is a candidate for the royal selection, much to his shock. He asks what someone of her status was doing in a den of bandits, to which she replies that they had threatened her citizens. She notes that Heinkel was likely after something the bandits had, as she lifts a cup containing a dull silver hue. His eyes are full of... nothing completely empty voids. The bandits claimed if you pour liquor into this cup and drink it, you should be cured of any malady. But it was a dud, and when Heinkel discovered this, he had slaughtered them all. Heinkel mutters that if she truly is a royal selection candidate, he can be of use to her, which catches her attention. Felt is a nuisance to the princess, and he has a plan to handle her. She asks what he would wish for in, in return, and he only replies, blood. His only request is the dragon's blood in the castle to help heal his sick wife. Unfortunately, the story is not officially translated, however, I will be delivering a detailed summary provided by Gourmet of Gluttony, so thank him in the comments. That is an order. The story begins with the coronation of Roswell L. Mathers at the age of 14, being thrust into that position after Roswell K. suddenly died. Lagunico was flourishing after 25 years of no battle, and against his normal nature, he began to feel sentimental. Roswell K. had avoided this place to not run into any familiar faces, showing us even more that Roswell was always pretty far from his ideal version. A boy bumps into Roswell who apologizes, but he will only forgive him if he hands back what he stole. They end up in a chase that gets broken by a huge figure that jumps before Roswell, and when he won't get the item back, closes the distance in an instant and hits the man so hard a shockwave radiates through the alley, before Roswell gets sucker punched by someone. Due to Roswell transferring bodies recently, he was not in peak condition and was knocked out by the hit. When he wakes up, someone is performing first aid on him, Russell Fellow, who offers to get his feather idol back. The men that mugged him were from the Brotherhood, a group of citizens rebelling against the class discrimination of the capital. Roswell taps his own gut, noting he has never had the aptitude for healing magic in any of his incarnations, and introducing Gaelic's blood did nothing. He believes that the reason he could never achieve it was that he lacks the necessary care for life, noting his entire life has been built on resentment and sacrifice. 
something I fundamentally do not believe, as we have seen Roswell care for life multiple times, whether it be his backstory or his Jay Mather's incarnation in the demi-human civil war, and even now, him trying to avoid the people he cared about in the capital. Roswell tells him that the Brotherhood and a faction known as the Gold Wing Party had been beefing. Roswell feels off, spinning around to see a four or five year old boy, who asks Roswell to not advance forward as his father is working. His father is, of course, Heinkel Estrella. Heinkel tries to talk to Marcos, who simply stares at the sky. He asks the man to give it up and rejoin the Royal Guard, and as they continue to talk, Marcos asks him why he accepted a job he's so obviously unsuited for. He tries to calm his volunteers, met by disbelief by Marcos. Heinkel admits he was pressured into this, but has a duty to do so, as Marcos continues to deride Heinkel's decisions. Truly at his limit, Marcos tells him to pay attention to something that matters, like his family, which causes Heinkel to draw his blade and put it to his neck. When Marcos doesn't flinch even an inch, he puts his sword away shamefully, walking away. Roswell then enters, speaking with Marcos, and we find out that he is the one who knocked him out. Roswell lets out a chuckle, saying that Marcos' hate for nobles is fake, making him react violently, kicking Roswell so hard it shakes the buildings around them. He tells the large man that his display earlier was shameful, and he didn't want anyone to leave today having the wrong notion about how powerful he really is, challenging him to a fight. Marcos asks what he gets for winning, and Roswell offers him info on the Golden Wing faction, and so the two of them collide, as the world shakes from the sheer collection of power. Heinkel talks with Reinhard, and the young boy says he was worried about his father. Heinkel apologizes for lashing out at his son for wandering around, asking if he's okay. He's just relieved he made it out of the slum safe, asking if his son is mad at him, but the boy says he feels only relieved. Heinkel begins to mutter about how he wishes Marcos listened to him, and Reinhardt asks who that is. He's very difficult and wants him to rejoin the Order. He asks if him rejoining would make his dad happy, and he responds that it would be a great joy. Heinkel feels genuine regret for worrying his child, picking him up and taking him home. Reinhardt nods softly before saying he received it. Marcos versus Roswell is evenly meshed and insanely tense. Roswell knew he could win with magic, but he found no point in a cheap victory. They go blow for blow, scorching Marcos' insides, shattering Roswell's arm. Sometimes a child of violence was born, called a Shura, and Marcos was a perfect example. Eventually, Roswell ends up victorious, and he refuses. Only a complete and total victory would satisfy him. Russell calms down Roswell, and the beaten Marcos says that Russell has a far blacker soul than Roswell, calling him manipulative. To fulfill the agreement, Marcos gives him the ornament back. The young boy comes back out, handing the item back, and accuses Roswell of being part of the Golden Wing Party, as his ornament has a Golden Wing design. Marcos, however, calls it fake. The Golden Wing Party must have been copying the design of one of the Mather's family ornaments. Roswell asks Marcos why he has become a simple bandit, and he replied that he didn't like being a knight. All he did was lock up the poor, starving people who don't have anything to eat. Jail was meant to change people's hearts. While every nation faced similar problems, Lagunica was the country with the largest division in class. To survive, the poor must turn to crime. And before Russell could give Marcos the info on the Golden Wing Party, Roswell cuts him off, asking if he would like to be his accomplice. We are introduced to Fareed Ibsen, the founder of the GWP. He would loved the kingdom, but knew it was in dire straits. Ever since the Demi-Human War, the true issues have been ignored. Discrimination was at an all-time high, Valachia was more hostile, and class disparity was only growing larger. Roswell, Marcos, Russell, and Farid all meet to discuss the issue between the GWP and the Brotherhood. Divided, they stand no chance of making changes within the nation, so Roswell will help them work together. He needs people who can run a business, and people who can work in it for many different prospects, such as the production and sale of Metia. Marcos accepts the peace offer, and also says he will rejoin the Imperial Knights, noting he feels a bit odd about the decision. Russell stands alone on the street after the declaration, asking the young boy from earlier to keep an eye on both the Brotherhood and the GWP. He asks the boy if any mind control had been detected, and Bell confirms the presence of a divine protection. As Russell looks up towards the Astrea mansion, Heinkel was suddenly woken up, asking if Reinhardt was also awake. Without Luan, Heinkel had struggled with parenthood. The window was now open, and someone told him to not turn around. Heinkel Estrella is under suspicion of civil disturbance. He is accused of using the divine protection of mind changing, and the man accuses him of using it on Marcos to rejoin the order. Heinkel bursts into a sprint, running and grabbing Reinhard. He asks if he did something for him, as the boy only shakes and apologizes. He tells Reinhard he's not angry, but he can't do that. Do not use that power again. You cannot twist someone's mind. He yells out for Russell to hear that his son will never use that power again. Reinhard is a sweet boy, and his treasure. Please do not take away my son. Please do not take away Luan's treasure to return to. He has lost so much and gained so little. Reinhard apologizes, saying he'll never use it again, and says he erased it. Heinkel is confused by his son's terminology, but is happy he turned it off. He asks if he can sleep with his father tonight when they return home, and Heinkel says, of course. As a figure stands in the window, telling Reinhardt to do his best to serve the kingdom. While unofficially translated, and just a detailed summary, this story is fucking flames for Heinkel. In Arc 5, he's not that interesting to be frank, but uh, the story was really good. And seeing how far he's fallen in Drunk Father or even Arc 5, it's just kind of sad to see now. 
He was a man who wanted to do well, but probably fell to the loss of his wife and alcoholism. Next up, we have three very short stories, with the first one picking up immediately at the end of Arc 5, as they head back to the burial domain. Al is concerned about their camp's image as the other parties head to the Pleiades Watchtower, and Priscilla points out something must have happened back in Priscilla that he can't stomach. What rattles around inside of Al's head is Subaru. Not in that way, but more so the thought of an isekai boy much the same as him, who had been burdened by just about everything, and still challenging his role impressively. That sense of defeat has been engraved in Al. It stung so deep that even now he considered looping, muttering his power is a curse as they arrive back at the mansion. Heinkel asks for a chance to redeem himself, and Priscilla is not happy about the stunt he pulled at the city, and Priscilla asks him if his sword has rusted. He of course has no idea what she's talking about until the windows shatter. Al is hit in the shoulder, and he slashes an invader in two. He looks over at the assassin, almost feeling bad for utilizing his dirty trick. Al rushes around looking for Schultz before confirming he's safe and returning him to Priscilla, as Heinkel fights off the last invader, having killed six others. Priscilla commenting this as a good start for making up for his disgrace. It seems we're gearing up for a very interesting future for Al's character. Uh, these stories had established that he's a Subaru Kinney, but worse, and now we're heading into the sort of inferiority complex that's bubbling towards Subaru. He's someone who was just as lost as Al was when he was first brought here, who has faced hardships just like Al has, yet has not developed the cynical, single-minded obsession that Al has, something that Subaru had already battled with when it came to Roswell in Arc 4. It's not just Subaru, though. Now he has to deal with the fact that there is actually a competent swordsman in his presence, someone who doesn't have to rely on cheating. Heinkel is an Astrea, he's strong, and even though Al already doesn't like him and his despicable attitude, his swordsmanship pales in comparison. Al takes off the mask of one of the assassins, and they deduce that they have come from the Empire. She notes that considering where they are from, the wound in Al's shoulder is likely poisoned as he begins to spin and collapse. As he hits the ground, she asks if it will really end like this for him. If so, what a terrible disappointment you are, Aldebron. Before he could tell her not to call him by that name, the stars went round, for the sake of granting him a new chance to redeem himself. After about 30 loops, Al had survived the encounter with the assassins, as they buried their bodies. He asks why Valakia would send assassins, and Priscilla responds that they just really felt like killing her. She lord dumps on Al about her past, and he just goes, Huh? Why would she participate in the royal selection if she has a position that sticks out a ton? She asks if she should just live in fear of them, saying that there is only one path forward, to settle this in person. Al, being his non-confrontational self, does not want to fight in Valachia, a land he is not mentally prepared to go back to, as he begs Priscilla not to go thousands of times through loops. When even after 1,000 loops, she cannot be swayed. He clenches his fist and says he has no objections. This was a reawakening of the same determination he had held on the day he decided to stop being a following star. Schultz is happy that the Divine Dragon put a stop to the fighting between the nations, and Heinkel asks if he is really going to believe a childish fairy tale. Even the boy is like, well, I'm just a kid and Heinkel notes he is Priscilla's weak point. Al considers Heinkel to be the epitome of horridness, willingly walking down a path of being loathed, rebuked, disdained, and shunned. They head back around Pristella, to a harbor nearby, with the goal of riding the river's current downstream to make it into the Empire. As they get on a boat, river bandits appear. They are taken aback by Priscilla's beauty, as she leans in to whisper something to the boss, as they get taken for ransom. Al asks if they are going to negotiate ransom, and Priscilla says they mustn't do anything like that. Lo and behold, the bandits kneel on the spot. She thanks them for welcoming her, that was quite a smart move. These people are private troops of an imperial noble, merely disguised as river bandits. The troops are from High Countess Selina Delacroix, and thus marks the end of the Priscilla side stories. I'm not going to say too much here in the post story section because I'm tired. Uh, both of my last two Re Zero videos have been over an hour long, and I need a break. And speaking of breaks, I have already read Arc 7 Phase 1, so we will get back to our regularly scheduled programming of phase reviews. Expect that in a couple weeks. Okay, I'm done. Goodbye. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for the fun of YouTube algorithm. You can check the description down below to follow me on Twitter, where I'm objectively correct all the time. Uh, you can also join my Discord, where we talk about My Hero Academia, ReZero, Jujutsu Kaisen, and stuff like that. And you can also now become a YouTube member, which basically just gives you access to behind-the-scenes content, a little badge on comments, and live stream chats, and access to some emotes. Only do so if you want to support the channel, though. But that's about it, though. Thank you for watching. See ya.